a special message from Capcom. Thank you for selecting Mega Man X7 for your PlayStation 2 computer entertainment system. We at Capcom Entertainment are proud to bring you this new addition to your video game library. Proud. That's what they call it. Mega Man X7 is one of the worst games I've ever played, and this is coming from someone who can enjoy Sonic 06 and Devil May Cry 2. In fact, my last video was one where I looked at the bright side on Mega Man X6, a game that five years ago received that very same opening sentence that just gave Mega Man X7. That might seem weird because I've spent so much time and energy establishing how different I want my current content to be from the stuff I made in high school, but in the case of X7, I think the game deserves that negativity. But that's the interesting thing. I'm not here to rage at X7, I'm here to laugh at X7, because this is also one of the funniest games I've ever played in my entire life. Now, I guess I haven't always said that about X7. I mean, five years ago, I was actually trying to be nicer to the game than most were, which is a plan that ended in a spectacular failure as I ended up tearing the game apart because it's just so bad. But to my defense, I didn't really recall X7 being so trash when I first played it. But the original review was when I realized that X7 was about as bad as everyone says, and from there it's only further gone down in my estimation. Not that I really make it a habit to replay Mega Man X7, but still. Now, I've been saying X7 is bad for the last few paragraphs, but it's time to start going into what makes the game so terrible. I mean, how bad could it really be? Before diving into it all, though, I wanted to use this opportunity at the start of the video to raise awareness for the Charge Syndrome Foundation. Charge Syndrome is an incredibly rare genetic disorder affecting 1 in 10,000 newborns. In the past 30 plus years, the Foundation has been promoting awareness for the condition, supporting families, and investing in research. I'm going to include a donation link in the description below. If even 5% of the people who watch this video donate, that alone make a huge difference in the lives of those living with Charge, and it would also mean something to me as someone who has family affected by the condition. Having said that, Mega Man X7. The game was released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2, one of the greatest consoles of all time, home to a plethora of genre-defining games. X7 was trying to innovate the Mega Man X series formula by taking the tried-and-true 2D gameplay and transitioning it into 3D, something many classic franchises had done in the late 90s, when Mega Man had remained a 2D side-scroller for Mega Man 8 and the 4th, 5th, and 6th Mega Man X games. The PS1 received the Mega Man Legends series, which was fully 3D, however, the Legends games were a separate series from the other two that changed the fundamentals of Mega Man, being a more Zelda-esque adventure game instead of a run-and-gun platformer. X7 being the first attempt to bring regular Mega Man gameplay into the third dimension, and it just crashed and burned. X7 is one of the most poorly received Mega Man games, definitely the worst reviewed installment in the Mega Man X series anyway. And I bring this up with intention, because when a new game comes out and really sucks, it brings up the natural question, how did this happen, and what is to blame? Well, when looking at the game, the critics seem mixed. In particular, GameSpy reported that X7 was a bit more compelling in 3D compared to its uninspired 2D segments, but was ultimately substandard. IGN said that the 3D in and of itself just didn't work, and future Mega Man installments going in that route were bound to run into the same issues as X7. IGN's take seemingly being how many fans feel regarding the 3D parts that take up a significant amount of Mega Man X7. I'm being intentionally vague right now, and have been for the whole video up to this point on what exactly those issues are, because I wanted to first set up that X7 tried something different and was met with poor reception. I really don't think 2D or 3D had anything to do with killing X7. I think the attitude this game was created with was the most fundamental problem behind the game. I've mentioned in almost all of these new X-Series videos the things I've found in the Mega Man X Complete Works book, and the portion on X7 was genuinely the most eye-opening of all, as this was a game I really didn't know much about prior to reading the book. It turns out that a lot of people who worked on the game genuinely wanted to take the X-Series in a new direction, in particular trying to reinvent the X-Series for this 3D leap. The comparison used was how the team that made Mega Man X1 was not afraid to look at the formula established in the original Mega Man games and see how they could reinvent it. X7's console leap being the perfect chance to really do something different once again. But the prevailing theme in the X7 chapter is that these designers joined the dev team too late in order to implement such ideas. The chapter on X7 ends with a quote from Keiji Inafune that reads, My personal opinion was that 3D is simply a graphical style. And just because a game's going 3D like X7 was, it doesn't mean we have to make a 3D game. This line of thinking is where all the faults of X7 lie. Taking Mega Man X and doing it in 3D was not the problem here. Mixing it in with old-school 2D sections was also not the problem. It's the way they went about designing their 3D sections. They basically had the attitude that they were just going to make a traditional Mega Man X game but flip the camera to be behind the characters, so when discussing the game's gameplay, I want to look at it through the lens of this design principle. The area of the game impacted the hardest by this would be the combat. Mega Man combat has been very consistent since the first game dropped in 1987. You know, you jump, you shoot, and the timing of your shots matters as the goal is to line your shots up with the enemies since your shots will only go forward. 
With the games being 2D, unless you wanted to damage boost past them, each enemy was a separate challenge you had to find your way around with precise shots and maneuvers. Simply plopping enemies for you to fight in 3D fails because you can then just walk around them. Splash Warfly's stage is the biggest example of this you can find in the entire game as the enemies are literally just placed on the map, and many players will just walk around them without any consequence. Consequence is one of the biggest problems. Like I said, you could try to walk through Mega Man enemies before, but you're bound to be taking damage doing it that way, so it would be against the player's interest to do that. Other 3D action games might lock the player in a room until they've cleared all the enemies, forcing you to engage with the game's mechanics. But in X7, it's a philosophy that worked for the other Mega Man games, just dropped into X7, that completely fails. But even in the occasional moment where 3D combat is required, it's still awful. X7 features three playable characters, Mega Man X, Zero, and the newcomer Axel. X and Axel basically play the same as both characters shoot their enemies from afar, while Zero slashes with his saber. For Axel and X, the combat doesn't work because of the game's lock-on feature. X and Axel will automatically target the enemies around you and you just need to mash the square button to make them shoot. This takes all the fun out of shooting enemies because the game is doing the hard part for you. Automatic lock-on is cited as one of the biggest issues with X7, but that's just the thing. If you intend to make the game in a way where the 3D segments control and feel like the previous games, you'd run into a massive problem with the depth perception, not knowing where enemies actually are in relation to yourself, and this would make the game even worse. The lock-on as is, is basically the only way the game could have worked with the control scheme being the exact same as the previous games. But that of course just leads to segments like this mini-boss where I'm not even trying to dodge or anything, I'm just standing there shooting because the lock-on does all the work for me. What you needed was a complete overhaul of the gameplay. They needed to do what Inafune said wasn't really necessary. Make X7 a 3D game. Simply put, many conventions from 2D games don't carry over to 3D ones, and designers need to consider how that gameplay can be adapted into a new dimension. Take a look at the Ratchet & Clank games which also dropped on PS2 for the perfect example on how to do this right. The camera is placed behind Ratchet as you must dodge enemy fire with your various backflips and jumps while aiming your weapons at your foes. Ratchet 2 added the strafe mechanic which allowed for more comfortable dodging, keeping the players actively engaged with the combat. Ratchet 3 and Ratchet Deadlocked gave the players more control as the camera would control where you're aiming, the perfect control setup for a 3D action platformer shooting game. Now maybe the X7 devs weren't going to implement controls seen in games that hadn't come out yet, but something akin to Ratchet 2 or even Ratchet 1 would have greatly made X7's 3D shooting combat more fun. Even in X7, the camera control is abysmal. You can customize the button layout like you've been able to in all the other X games, but for some reason the camera is locked to being on buttons. By default, the camera's on L1 and R1. Switching weapons, something that's always been on the shoulder buttons, is now on the right analog stick. Full 3D camera control on the right analog stick was something Mega Man Legends 2 got right three years before this game. I just don't understand how this control scheme was ever considered a good idea. More baffling being that there exist 3D sections without camera control at all when it really could have helped. But hey, look at the bright side. At least X and Axel are somewhat functional compared to Zero. Zero's combat really did not translate to 3D at all. I mean, he's already nowhere near as good in this game compared to the PS1 X games, since his attacks are all far slower than what he used to be able to pull off, killing the sense of speed and cool factor that came from being Zero before. But with no lock on, trying to fight enemies in 3D is such a chore as Zero. Just look. The attacks are so stiff and slow that I can barely hit the enemies while they're beating the crap out of me. Talking about Zero gives me the perfect excuse to bring up the greatest games of all time that also started on PS2, Devil May Cry. As I've said, giving action games protagonists like this reach over their opponents is super important. It's why Dante has the Stinger, and other means to get really close to the enemies and just go combo mad. Zero doesn't have that basic degree of playability, nor is he fun to play as and fight with anyway with the slow and clunky attacks. Zero's gameplay is the hardest to forgive because 3D swordplay was already an understood thing by this point. I mean, just look at the mobility granted to Link when playing Zelda Ocarina of Time, a game released in 1998. Dodging attacks, strafing around them, quickly getting in attacks and backing away, it was all there in a game released five years before X7. Why didn't they just alter the gameplay to be more like these infinitely more fun games? Well, it's because they just took what already existed and plopped it into 3D and made it less fun to boot. All these games I just compared X7 to excel for two things that X7 fails at. Achieving fun through intrinsic and extrinsic methods. In Ratchet & Clank, for example, jumping and dodging from enemy fire and blasting them back is fun in and of itself. But the game makes it so that you want to do that because killing enemies is the only way to gain experience points on your weapons and killing them drops currency that you need to buy more weapons. In Devil May Cry, going combo mad is super satisfying, I mean, obviously, 
but doing that increases your style gauge and the higher that is causes enemies to drop more currency upon defeat allowing you to purchase more moves in the shop that further increase your ability to do so. X7 doesn't do either since it lacks engaging mechanics for all three of its playable characters and on that note engaging with its mechanics is entirely optional. These are the fundamental flaws that kill Mega Man X7 in its 3D segments, an entirely shameful display after the Mega Man Legends series which took cues from other games and succeeded at the two factors I laid out before. Although I really haven't played either one of these games in years, it would be nice to revisit them for a video at some point between now and the end of time. Having said that, back to X7, because the game only gets worse from those lofty heights. I've mentioned in passing before that X7 features both 3D segments and 2D ones that are like the older games in the series. Generally speaking, 2D 3D hybrid mechanics aren't my preference since I think 2D games and 3D games are so fundamentally different, but hey, maybe 2D and X7 would fare better considering the fact that the 3D segments really aren't working in this game. But playing the game in 2D is when I really just see that this is one of the jankiest games I've ever played. Doing something as simple as wall jumping, something the X series has had since day one, causes the game to occasionally bug out. Getting hit will cause the player to fall to the ground and take a few seconds to get back up, killing the flow yet again, and the combat still doesn't work in 2D. Zero has to deal with the fact that his combos are slow and clunky, and then Axel and X are nowhere near as fun to play as the actual 2D games because of how the enemies are designed. Like I said, previous games were designed around you lining up your shots with the position of the enemies, but now, Lock-On takes care of that because the enemies are still flying around in 3D while you're locked to moving only left and right in these segments. What stupendous difficulty balancing. The lock-on takes all the engagement out of 3D combat, but then becomes your lifeline when fighting in 2D because they just didn't think to not give your enemies the ability to move outside of your line of movement. From there, what continues to kill any enjoyment you might get of the 2D segments is the actual level design. Where I must say, the game barely has any. The 3D segments are consistently these spaces you can run around in, but you basically just need to go in a straight line in order to clear. Snipe Anteater being a case where the level is entirely 3D so you can just damage boost your way to the goal and reach the boss in like 40 seconds. But then, stages with 2D elements are genuinely straight lines. Soldier Stonecalling and Tornado Tunyon's levels being the guiltiest parties where you have no goal besides rushing to the end of a straight line. I would love to think of some way to describe this that sounds different, but this is just how the game is. The latter case is trying to be like the staircase bits from X4 and X5, but there you have enemies to dodge and shoot, but now... Yeah, I'm just running forward as the stage repeats the same obstacles again and again. When the level design gets any more complex than that, the game falls flat in its face. Look no further than Win Crow Rang stage where you need a platform from jet to jet and the camera is just pointing down at you so you can barely see where you're going which will lead to your death. And then when you do know, the janky controls might still cause your demise. And then the later hallway section brings the depth perception issue to the forefront of your mind. One of the worst levels in the game right here. Although. Massive shout out to the fact that every time you die, you have to sit through this 10 second long cutscene of absolutely nothing. It's hilarious. The hits keep on coming as Mega Man X7 is, for a plethora of reasons, one of the slowest action platformers I have ever played. From the very moment you boot the game, you'll find that the characters just aren't as fast as they were in previous games. Jumping, dashing, and dash jumping all feel way heavier in X7 than the previous six games. I don't think the ground speed is actually that much lower than it was in the previous games, it just feels that way with how slow the rest of the game is. The dash speed is definitely lower though, but I'll return to that in a moment. In stages as long and dull as these, getting through them at a slower pace certainly doesn't help. What is definitely quantifiably low is the damage values on your attacks. When starting the game, even the most basic enemies will take an eternity to be killed. No better example than trying to use Axel's special ability, the copy shot, where you have to charge for a second or two and then shoot a tiny blast that does the most minuscule of chip damage and hope that it will eventually die, allowing you to turn into that form. But who would ever want to use such an ability when it takes so long to use, and then the results are... Well, what you're seeing on the screen right now. Riveting gameplay in this Mega Man X7. Many bosses are the worst with this. Tornado Tunyons being the one that comes to my mind immediately. You'll shoot the weak spot for what feels like eons, and it'll just keep going and going and going. But the parts where you fight are split up by this slow-moving spinning blade thing that takes nothing to dodge. It's like, if you could just sum up X7 as one mini-boss, it would be this. Attacks that take no effort to dodge, but take 15 times as long to end, and damage output on your part that defies comprehension. I said this was a quantifiable problem, and that's because it is. 
You see, Mega Man X7, the English version of Rockman X7, decided to reduce the damage values on all your attacks. The Mega Man Wiki shows the damage values for each attack on each boss, and you can clearly see that Rockman X7 has higher damage values across the board. This really is a mysterious case. I mean, why would they do this? To make the game a minimum of 10 minutes longer? I know the numbers don't look like much in the table here, but I decided to load up Rockman X7 on the Legacy Collection and was able to confirm with my own two eyes that yes, X7 feels faster paced in Japanese because you aren't wailing on the same bosses and enemies for nearly as long. Just look at how much damage the Axel Bullets do on Soldier Stone Kong in Japanese compared to English. But of course, it's not like playing the game in Japanese suddenly makes it really fun. I mean, everything I've said in the video thus far still stands. Including the fact that the characters feel really slow to play as, and that's where the upgrades via Rescuable Reploids come from. Rescuable Reploids gave you parts you could equip in X6, but in X7 it goes for more of a skill tree approach. In each stage, there are 16 Reploids to save, and two of them will give you chip parts to upgrade your character of choice. Which includes things like making your basic attacks more powerful, increasing your dash speed, and lengthening your invincibility frames. When you do these last two, you can really bum rush through every obstacle in the game like it ain't no thing. The method of getting character upgrades in X7 is certainly adequate in a void. However, I don't think these stages needed rescuable reploids. I think they needed something entirely different. I think X7 should have had a shop and defeated enemies will drop a currency that you can spend on these character upgrades. You see, this is a callback to earlier in the video where I said you have genuinely no incentive to fight enemies besides a few rooms that require it. And yeah, this is a solution that works. It's been done before in the X series. Mega Man Extreme 2 on Game Boy Color did that. But I can get back to that game another day. Like I said, the part system in X7 works for what it is. The game just could have done this element in a way that propped up its 3D level design a bit more is all I'm saying. The most nefarious purpose of the Rescuable Reploids is needing them to play as X, though. For story reasons, Mega Man X, the title character of the game, is not playable at the start. You have to rescue 64 Reploids to get this cutscene where X decides to join you. I can't prove this, but I think the reason the designers did this was pretty sinister. X7 has a new character, Axel, like I said. But functionally, he's really not that different from X. And instead of a powerful charge shot that blows enemies away, Axel has the lame copy shot. I feel like needing to unlock X is just the game's way of trying to get you to warm up to Axel in an entirely inorganic way since you're forced to play as him. But since you probably don't like the game anyway, it just makes you resent the fact that you need to play at least four of the eight Maverick stages before you can unlock Mega Man X in a Mega Man X game. When you do, you'll probably have to backtrack for the Dr. Light capsules you ran by earlier, because unlike X5 and X6, Zero cannot collect Dr. Light capsules on X's behalf. No, you need to extend the playtime by an extra few minutes by running through these levels again and grabbing what you missed. The four parts of X is Glide Armor, which will give X the definitive edge over Zero and Axel, because the body parts of the Glide Armor make it so that X no longer falls over from big hits like he used to, and like Zero and Axel still do. Regardless of how many upgrades the other characters have, no knockback and a big charge shot make X the go-to playable character in X7. It's also really funny how you can use the Glide Armor's foot parts to skip right over the last segment of gameplay in Flame Hyenar's level because balanced 3D level design, am I right? To give an unironic compliment to X7, you can at least collect whichever parts of the armor you want without needing all four, fixing that mistake from X5 and X6, meaning you can just skip past the worthless head parts if you don't feel like grabbing it in order to use the benefits provided to you by the other three pieces of the set. Though, while I'm on the subject of positives, I might as well mention the other things I liked about X7, since it is an incredibly small list that I couldn't think of a natural spot to place anywhere else in the video. First, X7 introduces the partner mechanic into the main X series. X and Zero have always been a team, but X7 is the first game to really make you feel like it, as before each stage you have to decide on which team of two you want to bring into each level between X, Zero, and Axel. Now, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, especially since X and Axel have basically the same moveset, just with X being way better. However, I enjoy the element of switching between two characters on the fly in the middle of stages. It just further helps the Maverick Hunters feel like a team compared to previous games, and I like that. Then there's the music. Not really much to say here, I just think the music in X7 is pretty good. If I need background noise when I'm on the computer, I can never go wrong with X7's soundtrack. Some of my favorites include...
But why be nice to X7 when I could be doing the opposite of that? I was talking about how this is one of the most slow-paced games I've played, and I'm still not done with that talking point. This is also one of the most overly tutorialized games I've played as well. X6 tried making the Hunter Navigator, Alia, a lot more interesting as a character with a full-on backstory and all that, but in X7, we're back to the non-character that tells you not to jump into bottomless pits. Her tutorial messages are still optional, like in X6, however, she makes her presence much more known than she did in that game. Can you hear me, eh? If you pick up her calls, text will scroll by explaining something really obvious, the speed of molasses. Props to the team behind the X Legacy collection, they clearly knew X7 sucked because they included a trophy for reading every single piece of Alia dialogue in the entire game. Pretty diabolical stuff from the devs, if you ask me. Alia talking to you mid-stage is such a clear attempt at trying to do something interesting, but just failing completely. I've always said that Alia and the Hunter's support team idea seemed like it was inspired by Metal Gear Solid and its codex system, but the X devs never fleshed out the idea. Yeah, the codec would see players being instructed on things that might be obvious to some players, but these were also characters you could have full interactions with throughout the Metal Gear series, and these hidden conversations are fondly remembered by so many fans. This reminds me of when we first met. I was the one inside the locker that time. We're equal now, huh? Not unless I wet my pants. That's a low blow, Snake. If they wanted to do something interesting, maybe Cygnus could serve that Colonel Campbell role, as you could call him about your mission and he'll have something different to say to all three hunters. Douglas can give you hints on upgrade locations, and Alia might help with boss patterns or something. I don't know. Maybe they didn't feel like writing that much dialogue? But they give all three hunters different cutscene dialogue with the various bosses, so why can't the navigator system be given the same amount of thought? It's just a flop of an idea. But at least it's optional in the stages. Where it's not is in the menus. X7 has some of the slowest menus I have ever seen. Alia will explain everything in painstaking detail, including what Reploids do every time you see this Reploid rescue screen. Alia will explain how to scroll through menus when the game begins, and just generally, the game takes a really long time to get things done in the menu. Just watch. This game is just shockingly slow paced. How many more ways can I say that? On that note, the game is a technical mess too. For this video, I played X7 primarily on my PS2 because I like the nostalgia of playing old games on old consoles. And here you see X7 is a game with baffling technical faults and optimization issues. No example being as large as the loading screens. X7 levels are divided into different chunks like X4 through X6, but each of these takes like 10 to 15 seconds to load with this disgusting screen that reads, now loading. I know some people think it's not fair to bring up another PS2 game, Jack and Daxter, when trashing X7 on a technical level, because J&D was made by Naughty Dog, some of the most efficient programmers in the industry. But really though, it shocks the mind to see a game with as large of a world as Jack have no loading screens. Meanwhile, X7 over here has these incredibly small areas that take an eternity to load, with chronic performance issues too. Once action is on the screen, the game starts chugging like it's nobody's business. When the effects are nothing special, the models aren't that complex, the backgrounds are simple, like what is going on? And I can only conclude that the game is just poorly optimized. Certain segments of the game show that the devs are capable of using tricks like culling, so if they can deload things that aren't on the screen, it just further baffles the mind how it takes so long to load when other contemporary games load faster, load without breaking the immersion, and run with stable performance. Now, I of course need to mention that the 2018 X Legacy Collection version of X7 does load significantly faster than it did on PS2, making X7 one of the few cases where I go against my anti-remaster philosophy by considering this the definitive version of X7. However, even with shorter load times, that only further showcases how poorly put together X7 is. I mean, you still have to load the save screen separately from the game over screen. I mean, why? It's the simplest of things. Generally speaking, X7 has the production value of a CDI game. This ties into what I was just saying about how shocking it is that this game loads for so long. The visuals in this game could be downscaled to fit on PS1 if you lowered the resolution and frame rate enough. The backgrounds look unappealing, often just being PNGs. The models in the backgrounds are low poly and low res. The draw distance is abysmal. You can outright see the seams on the lava here. 
and the transitions from one set piece to another is as subtle as a brick to the face. I mean, look at this part of Soldier Stone Kong's level. The background goes from kryptonite fog to fully modeled in the span of two nanoseconds. Some of the backgrounds genuinely are some of the worst I've seen in a 21st century game. The background of the second half of the Palace Road stage is a flat shade of dark orange and it just looks terrible. The game relies on effects and sounds that are really cheap and lame, like Ride Borsky's abomination of a stage. The threat here is that 20 bombs are on the roadway and you need to disarm the bombs, but I was very curious what would happen if you ran out of time. The obvious would be cutting to a cutscene where the road explodes, but I knew X7 wasn't going to do that, so I wanted to know what they were going to do. And the answer is put some explosion effects on your vehicle and then fade the screen to red. Great effect there, X7. But hey, at least there are explosion sounds. The game plays no sound effect when collecting items, which just feels really bootleg, but then damages the gameplay experience when you're in fast-paced scenarios and aren't sure if you got a collectible or not, because no sound was played. In the cutscenes, the character models barely animate, and when they do move, calling it animation is a stretch. We watch these character models lifelessly stand there, not moving their mouths one bit as the game tries to pretend there's more going on than there is with cheap zooms and camera pans. Again, compared to its contemporaries, this is just embarrassing. I mean, X7 was released in between Jack 2 and Ratchet and Clank 2 in 2003. Look at the cutscene animation in these games. They're cutting edge for their time and still look good today. In X7, it was unacceptable then and still is now. The voice acting is just as bad. <laughs> Oh, you're the famous X. I thought you were out of commission. I was put back on the job thanks to you, creeps. So you're saying we're playing too rough? Fool! This is our natural state, just like you. No! Hey, Honcho, I'm here to defeat you. Why, you... Red gave you a home and this is how you repay him? You worthless upstart! Dude, your breathing's getting heavy. Calm down! I know it's not fair to write off everything a story's trying to do when the presentation is this bad, but come on. The cutscene between X and Snipe Anteater is so funny and it's because of how seriously they're playing it while there's almost no animation and sci-fi B-movie acting. What reaction is appropriate beyond gut-busting laughter? Oh, splendid! Even better than expected! How long must this madness go on? <laughs> Let me ask you, how long has this madness been going on? <gasps> the annals of history contain endless records of war. The madness will never end. You're wrong. We can create a world without war. Utopia is not just a dream. You can't build a utopia on top of the graves of rebels like myself. But even so, I, I must follow my beliefs. The auditory torture of playing X7 coming to fruition when you have to face off against Ride Borsky and Flame Hyenard, the latter especially. These being bosses were random, Obnoxious audio samples are being spammed into the player's ears, and somehow, no one in the QA department saw a problem with it. But of course, bad voice acting is only the beginning. X7 features a pretty decently sized story for Mega Man standards, one that is presented pretty poorly. I mean, I was just comparing the in-game cutscenes to the likes of Ratchet and Jack, but then there are the other cutscenes that just look like the kind of cutscenes you'd see on the Game Boy Advance or the DS. Drawn images with character portraits that are surrounded by text boxes. For a console release, it's just not that appealing to look at, especially when these can get pretty long. I mean, the cutscene following the intro stage is genuinely seven minutes long, and it's nothing but these portraits accompanied by really bad acting. That's quite enough! You need to back off and pay the deuce for your crimes! At least these are skippable, but man, it's just so bad. But trying to ignore all of that, how is the actual story of X7? I really dig the concepts behind the stories of basically every X game, and I'd say X7 has still got that going for it. The idea is that the world is well on its way to recovery from the Eurasia incident in X5, but the Maverick Hunters have two new problems. 
First is the rise of the vigilante maverick hunting gang called Red Alert that is causing all kinds of trouble, and then X decides to remove himself from the front lines after all these countless battles because he thinks the world can achieve peace without the fighting. One of the most impressive members of Red Alert, Axel, tries to leave the group because something about them changed, and Red Alert, led by a reploid named Red, hunt Axel down to get his copy chips so they can use the power themselves. Zero catches Axel, and that's when Red Alert challenges the Maverick Hunters to a contest to who gets Axel, and with X still choosing not to fight, Zero and Axel face off against Red Alert until X finally decides he's going to join, until they find out that shock of all shocks, Sigma was behind it yet again. By the way, Am I an idiot for just now realizing that these cutscenes towards the end of the game with Sigma and Red are supposed to be taking place before the story of the game? The change in Red Alert that made Axel leave the group was Sigma joining and pulling the strings to set up another fight between him and X and Zero. And these cutscenes detail the events that led to that. I don't know, I just never even thought of that until now. Hey, when looking at the story, it should be simple. But it, like almost everything in this game, also doesn't work. This starts with X's decision not to fight. I'm still convinced they did this to make the players play as Axel, but from a story perspective, it's just doing X so dirty. Yeah, I know it's a meme that X hates the never-ending battles he partakes in, but the point of X is that he has this human-like sense of sadness over the needless bloodshed, but X is the first one to charge in guns blazing when innocent lives are at stake. That's what makes him a badass hero. But complaining about violence and doing nothing while Zero, his best friend, is left as the only top hunter out in the field while Red Alert is causing so much damage is just not X to me. Then there's the fact that Sigma's the main villain for the seventh game in a row. Honestly, while playing the game this time, I was thinking that Sigma's way of weaseling into Red Alert's ranks by pretending to be a sympathizer for their cause is pretty interesting to see, but it just falls flat because Sigma returning is the most predictable outcome at this point simply because of the fact that it happens in every game. Red Alert could have been pretty interesting on its own as a group of Reploids taking justice into their own hands, having lost faith in the institutions like the Maverick Hunters, but making Sigma responsible for it just removes all agency from Red Alert. As my friend Twitch from Reploid Revo said, The whole idea of you causing the deaths of the Red Alert ranks just doesn't work because Sigma manipulated the situation yet again to cause Red Alert to be no different than any other Maverick. It's Sigma's fault without question. Sigma has a pretty interesting scheme in almost every game, but his usurping otherwise interesting antagonists at the end of the game is a plot twist that's just stale after seeing it so many times. The game almost seems self-aware of that fact by having X and Zero be completely unfazed by his return despite not even guessing this was his doing beforehand, and then showing Sigma act like a total buffoon in his cutscenes with the heroes. It gets to the point where he isn't a menacing villain, he's just a goober. <laughs> Thanks for coming by, fellas. This way I can face you in the comfort of my own home. That's right, folks. I'll do it again and again. I will make X and Zero mine. Now come and get me. Give me a good fight, like you always do. Leaving X7 as a story with an interesting premise that just doesn't work. But then, as if everything I've said in this video thus far wasn't bad enough on their own, the flaws of X7 compound upon each other in what is easily the worst endgame in Mega Man history. The finale of X7 takes place across two final levels, where the first is this long as all get out chase with a giant mechanoloid. I don't mean that lightly, this part goes on forever, and all you have to do is move the analog stick forward, occasionally getting out of the way of an obstacle. It's such a painful slog to play through. However, that is merciful in comparison to the game's final stage, Crimson Palace. The game throws everything in the kitchen sink at the player right before the final curtain call, including multiple segments where the player has to do nothing but run forward damage boosting. Some actual platforming is finally included, but it's not half as good as the opening level of X2 in the final stage. And there's even an enemy rush here that's easily dealt with by standing there holding the shoot button, and your damage boost through some slow boulder chases as well. This level was pulling out all the stops to make sure you fall asleep. But to compound upon that, you get some of the worst Mega Man bosses of all time. First up, Red. A simple boss in theory. Jump from platform to platform trying to hit the guy while he randomly appears on one of them. But remember how everything takes forever to die in X7? Well, Exhibit A. It's so drawn out because he has so much health that takes so long to deplete. And if your jump gets screwed up by the janky collision detection then you will fall into the abyss, die and have to start over. The draw distance is also somehow not good enough to keep these clouds on screen at all times. The stage just keeps going on after that until you get to the true lowlight of Mega Man X7, the boss rush. This game is the mother of all terrible boss rushes because it takes an eternity. I have consistently criticized the boss rushes of each X game, and it seems X7 is the one where everyone agrees with me. However, what I find interesting is that in X7, the boss rush is trash for basically all the same reasons as the previous games. 
It's a blatant way to reuse content that makes the game that ever so bit longer right before the final boss. But X7 makes it a special flavor of unspeakable because in and of themselves, the bosses in this game are atrocious because, well, you guessed it, they each go on for an eternity, have attacks take a millennium to end even if you already knew how to dodge it from the first frame of the attack, the collision is jank, and all that pleasant stuff. But the game compounds upon all these already bad things in its boss rush by making the player wait through a lengthy loading screen before each boss, and if you die, that's another load screen you have to sit through to then hit a load screen to try again. It's dreadful. This is the Agony Matrix from Justice League Unlimited. If you want to make it go by slightly faster, I can only advise this. Zero's Lightning Tornado does pretty good damage on bosses, and the G Launcher for Axel also shreds bosses to pieces. Funny how the actual special weapon Axel gets from this is barely usable, but its secondary function might be the most consistently powerful weapon in the game. And if you thought the level was finally done after the boss rush, you have to face Sigma. The first phase is pretty easy. I mean, it has no bottomless pits and janky collision to work with, so of course it's easy. Just spam charge shots to X and you're good. The second phase has always been the bane of my existence. In fact, in my original review from five years ago, I did this big montage showing all my deaths at the hand of Sigma in X7. But on this playthrough, I discovered a horrifying truth about the final form of Sigma. This might be the easiest boss in the game if Zero is on your team. What made this boss so annoying before was plummeting into the abyss because of the janky controls and or Sigma's punching attack. But what I found out was that if you jump to the second highest platform of the bunch, Sigma can barely touch you. If he fires his T-posing energy balls, they just won't hit you. The other platform will get in the way and destroy them. When he sends his green energy balls, Zero's deflect move from Soldier Stone Kong will effortlessly bounce them back at Sigma doing massive damage. When he gets up close and shoots energy blasts, you just slash them back at him as Zero, and when he does the crotch laser, you switch to X and blast him from a higher platform. And most shocking of all, if you just do the deflect move as Zero, the punch attack will just not damage you and you can then attack him. I was playing this in the call with Retropolis Zone and we were both floored at the fact that you can literally beat Sigma by doing absolutely nothing. He will actively damage himself more than half the time. Legendary stuff, X7. Legendary stuff. Depending on which character deals the final blow to Sigma is the deciding factor on which of the three character endings you get. Although first, Sigma gets blasted out the window like a punk in this cutscene. I'll never lose! <laughs> yeah, guess that takes care of him. Actually, where are they right now? I mean, we climbed up the Crimson Palace throughout the whole level. But then Red's boss takes place in some clouds with rocks all around, and the cutscene right after that is in a crumbling basement. We then climb higher and higher, only to be falling down an infinite elevator in Sigma's first battle, but then we fade to black and battle Sigma in outer space? Then we're back in a room in the cutscene. What is happening here? But as I was saying, the endings are all a flop. I mean, the whole point of the story was this arc where X distrusts Axel and won't let him be a hunter at the beginning, which would obviously end with Axel proving himself and being a hunter, right? Well. No. In both X and Axel's endings, X still won't let Axel be a Maverick Hunter, and then the game just ends. Wow, what a great story. No resolution to the obvious character arc. To be fair, I guess I was surprised by that. Good work for X7 going against expectations. Then Zero's ending is a pile of nothing as he dreams of X going on a rampage. Yeah, maybe that's a copy X setup, but at this point, the X games have been relentlessly sequel baiting for so long that it falls on deaf ears. Ending Mega Man X7. Mega Man X7 truly is one of the worst games I've ever played in my entire life. No matter what angle I look at this game from, all I see is disastrous failure. You start with the faulty premise of just taking the existing Mega Man X formula and plopping it into 3D, something that would never work, and well, it didn't. From there, it just gets worse and worse with stunningly low production values for a 2003 PS2 game, a boatload of mechanics that don't work, terribly designed bosses and levels, and characters that aren't fun to play. I used to be in the camp that said the sheer frustration of X6 made it a worse experience than X7, but now, heavens no. X6 plays like the rest of the X games, and while I don't think it's a good game, it's not even in the same league as Mega Man X7 if you ask me. A game that will leave players in shock and awe just how bad it turned out. But I feel really bad for the people who made this game. I firmly believe that nobody sets out to make a bad game and give consumers a poor product. But I'm sure this game was rushed out the door by Capcom and given a low budget like most Mega Man games in the hopes that the returns would make up for it. The team behind this game initially thought they were going to have the chance to rethink X for the series' 3D debut, but that just didn't happen and instead we got this fundamental flop of a game. 
A total low light for Mega Man, a series that all in all doesn't have that many bad games in it compared to just how many main games make up the series. But that's all I'm gonna say on X7. The game is terrible. But I had a lot of fun making this video, believe it or not, because like I said, I think X7's hilarious. Playing it with friends watching is such a fun experience as we all react to the terribleness. So I'm in good spirits making the video. But on that note, next time we're going back to Mega Man X8, a game I rarely ever play, so we'll see how that turns out. In the meantime, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.